Paul Stetsowitz here doing the Cam's Corner update on the 108. Uh, we're on episode 14 already, and we're going to talk about uh, basically the landing gear system on the airplane. Uh, we removed it, checking for damage, and uh, how the mechanism actually works. And at the end of the video, we're actually going to talk about uh, kind of what it takes to, uh, to do all this type of work, so stay tuned. All right, everybody, we're going to talk uh, specifically here on this episode about the uh, landing gear on the BF-108. And uh, normally we don't talk specifics, but the landing gear on the 108 is very interesting. And there's actually two ways that landing gear are on most airplanes, and that is either a fixed stationary landing gear or retractable. And most retractable landing gears are hydraulically operated. Uh, but on the 108, it's actually a mechanical system. That's what makes it kind of interesting to talk about. And the only other airplane that I know of that I've worked on that has a mechanically retractable gear is the FM2 Wildcat that we did years ago. And that system is also very interesting. Um, but we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about removing the gear. And the first thing we're gonna discuss uh, is uh, the gear itself. Now this is the, this is the left-hand gear that's been pulled out of the airplane. Um, it's all in pretty decent shape. One of the things we were checking for here is any kind of damage because we knew uh, after we stripped the airplane that this airplane was involved in some type of ground loop. So we're looking for damage, so that's why I decided to pull everything out. I didn't actually initially see any damage on the gear itself, but the first thing that we noticed when we peered, pulled the gear doors off the airplane is that there is damage to the doors. And this is actually the, the lower door. It's a very simple structure. Uh, it's an aluminum skin on the outside, and inside it has a steel tube framework. Now, when this airplane had the accident, of course, this door must have been partially ripped off, and there was a repair done right here, and they actually cut this piece out, and they welded in another piece to fix all that. Well, unfortunately, they did something very odd here. Um, these tabs that are sticking up here are not supposed to be joggled like that. They're supposed to be straight tabs. So I'm not sure why they did that. That's another one odd thing. And then of course um, the doors are bolted to uh, the gear leg itself. And so I'm assuming that it just had one hole that the bolt went through that bolted it to the clamp. But for some unknown reason they drilled a series of multiple holes <laughs> in this bracket. Not even nicely done. And so I guess they had many different options as to put the door on. So this is a bit of an issue. We're either going to have to repair this or source another part. I'm actually uh, on, the, on the trail of finding somebody that may have this whole steel frame NOS, which would be great. It would save us a lot of time. So that's one strange thing that happened that got damaged. Another thing that got damaged uh, were the upper gear doors. This is a very simple little piece. It's just a flat, smaller door that's at the top. Um, the door is fine, but the brackets have been redone. And these, again, are like homemade pieces. They're actually shot in with brass rivets don't know why. Um, very poorly done. So that has to be um, fixed and repaired. Of course, I don't know what this is supposed to look like. So I'm trying to source someone who has a good gear door that has the original brackets so I can actually uh, remanufacture those. Other damage to the gear doors, some of the brackets that hold the door on. Um, this is a piece here. This piece must have got snapped off and somebody did a really makeshift weld job to that, which is very poorly done. So that will have to be repaired or hopefully a new piece also sourced and then also the piece that holds on the small gear door a series of little adjustable screw uh, pieces that you can adjust the door back and forth uh, these are all bent and all kind of out of whack uh, so probably gonna have to have these machine new or again hopefully find some new pieces so even though there isn't any damage to the gear itself the door has suffered quite a bit of it so we we'll have to take care of that but going back to the gear uh, we've taken a lot of this apart attached to the gear course uh, is the brakes. Uh, the 108 uses a very old-fashioned uh, shoe brake uh, kind of design. This is very common in the 1920s and 1930s. Sometimes it was mechanically operated, sometimes hydraulic. In the case of the 108, it is hydraulic. And basically, you hit the brake pedal, it pushes fluid down to this little cylinder here, and it pushes the shoe out onto the drum. Really poor system. I'm sure the braking on the 108 is not very nice, but this is what was in the airplane. Now, some people have upgraded the airplane to different systems. We're going to go back with the original. Uh, I just want to keep the airplane as original as possible. So we pulled the brakes off, um, cleaned all those up. These are some of the pieces that came off. These, of course, are going to have to be um, new 
uh, shoe is replaced. These are all worn out. These are all magnesium pieces. Uh, these are pretty decent. One piece broke as it came off, but I have a couple spares, so that's uh, going to help us out. And of course, the back of the uh, brake assembly itself is also a magnesium plate. These cleaned up very nice, so those are probably going to go again with no issues at all. Um, so those are good. A lot of small parts that hold the brakes on. They're all here. These pieces have all come off. They're on pretty decent shape. They're little scissors um, that connect this, uh, this pieces that go on here. Those pieces are all cleaned up. They're not damaged. They're fine. All these pieces will go out for plating uh, like we've done on some of the other uh, projects that we've worked on. So that's moving along, making some good progress there. But it's very interesting how the gear is actually attached to the airplane and also how it, it works. And the gear, first of all, at the very top where it's attached, it has this very, really beautifully machined piece. And it's this large nut right here. And this nut actually has reverse threads. One side is right hand thread, the other side is left hand. And what happens is this actually just threads on here. And as you put it on, the other piece, if I can get it on there, there we go. Once that's on, what attaches next is the little gear piece, another beautifully engineered component. Uh, this was a this is a cast piece that was machined, a final machining. That piece has the opposite threads that the landing gear legs on, and basically it just attaches on, and it screws on, and that's how the gear is actually uh, attached. It's very very simple. The gear came off very quickly, uh, so it's a very nice system as far as how is that is attached. If you watch that video on Periscope Films, you actually see uh, the, one of the guys on the assembly line installing the gear and he has a special wrench uh, that turns this nut on and off and that's how the gear is installed. So these pieces are all are in good shape. And then the next step is, of course is this piece and how it attaches to the next component which is this big cast box piece. This goes up inside the wheel well of the airplane. Again, another steel uh, cast piece. It has a worm gear uh, up inside of it here. And this piece actually just fits right up inside, just like that. And it meshes with the worm gear. Get that in there, just like that. And then it has a large pin that actually runs through the other side that holds all this in place. This is another odd thing about this. This pin goes inside here and then they give you, I don't know why they did this, but they give you all these different options to safety this pin in place. It was actually safety in this oblong hole, but for some reason they give you five other, five other positions to, to safety that. I'm not sure why that is, um, but that pin is, uh, locks all that in place. So once that's all in there, of course, you have your mechanism and this worm gear is attached to the handle, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. And it just simply turns that and you can see that simple action of that worm gear meshing with this gear rotates that whole mechanism. Very smooth, very nicely done. And that's basically uh, how that works. All these pieces are in good uh, condition. We're actually going to take most of these components and we're going to send them off to NDT to make sure there isn't any cracks in these components here before we uh, actually reinstall them on the airplane. And so that's how all that works. Um, we're going to talk about, uh, we have the rest of the gear actually broken down a little bit further so we can talk about what's actually inside of all this. Uh, so let's go check that out. All right, we're going to talk about some of the um, components here to the landing gear. We actually have the uh, right side basically disassembled, almost completely disassembled. And of course, lazy with a bunch more components. This is the main portion um, of the gear leg itself. This is the piece we talked about earlier that threads on uh, to that that attaches it to the rest of the airplane. And of course, uh, the rest of the cylinder here. So that's your one component right there. Um, Inside of this is this massive spring. I mean, look at this thing. <laughs> this thing goes up inside, uh, fits all the way down in here. And this is part of, I think, part of the shock absorbing system or maybe even how you set the level of the airplane. I'm talking to some people as to what these springs actually do. I'm not positive, but that sits down inside of there, uh, inside the chamber. And then, of course, you have your actually the oleo piece itself, the piece that's moving up and down inside 
of the landing gear. Now this piece had to come out because as you can see there's a lot of rust on the bottom portion. This is a portion of the strut that was exposed and that of course over the years has rusted and pitted. So this has to come out. This is going to have to be sent off somewhere to be kind of ground down and then re-hard chromed uh, so we can hopefully reuse this piece. So that's one of the main reasons we took it out. Uh, attached to this piece is also the lower portion of the gear where the wheel attaches and this is pretty interesting too. Uh, I thought actually this piece was uh, kind of sweated in there or pressed in there but it's not. It's actually threads inside of there. This whole piece is kind of threads inside of there. It just stops and then it has a pin that goes through it uh, that holds it in place. So that comes off as a component. Another beautifully engineered piece. This again will be cleaned up, uh, checked for cracks and then repainted. So that part is off. And the only other thing we haven't taken off, and we're trying to do that today, is that inside the upper portion of this strut piece, there is another spring in here. Um, this is held on by this little kind of nut assembly right here. And we started taking this off, and what we kind of realized as we were taking it off that it felt like it was under a load, like this spring is maybe under tension. So before we got to a point where we were going to maybe injure ourselves or have a spring come smacking us in the head. We kind of stopped and trying to get some information to, uh, from some other people that have taken one of these apart. And so um, before we do that, we're going to be safe. There's also oil in the strut that actually helps in the uh, shock absorbent qualities. It must have like a small uh, a needling uh, orifice that allows fluid to pass through um, the strut itself that gives it that quality to absorb those shocks. These pieces hopefully are all going to check out very good. One of the things we want to check with these is if they're bent at all because we know the airplane was in an accident. They look pretty good, but we're going to check for any damage uh, right there. So again, uh, have the gear almost completely apart except for that main spring. And so we're making progress there. And then the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, a closer examination of actually how uh, the gear mechanism works. So let's check that out. All right, we're going to talk about a little closer about how the gear actually works. We actually have the entire uh, retracting mechanism out of the airplane. We spoke about this earlier in one of the other videos. We actually sh showed the gear going up and down. Um, but now that we have it out of the airplane, you kind of get a better idea of how all this works. And of course, the main portion of it is the uh, handle inside the cockpit that actually activates everything. Another well-engineered piece. And of course, this is just a simple ratcheting uh, mechanism that uh, in one direction as you turn it, it's actually making the shafts turn clockwise in both directions. And then once you do it, when it make the gear go the other way, you just turn the handle and that switches the ratchet, just like a ratchet you have, like a craftsman tool or a snap-on tool. It shifts everything back the other way and it makes everything turn the opposite direction. Attached to that, of course, are the shafts that run out to the gear itself. Very simple um, steel shaft attaches to the little uh, spline in here and it runs out to the gearbox that we talked about uh, earlier, which is this piece right here. And of course that rotation from the shaft is rotating the worm gear, which of course is transmitted to uh, the gear on the uh, landing gear portion, lowering and raising uh, the landing gear. Um, pretty straightforward system. It's actually a really clever the way it's done. Um, not much to go wrong. I'm even surprised how well this piece is. We cleaned it up. I thought maybe I was gonna have to use the piece that I bought because I did find an NOS, uh, one of these uh, last year on eBay. But uh, amazingly looking at this piece, there's actually no, not even that much wear on it. I'm going to take it apart and check a little bit closer. Of course, that's, it's going to get painted. All the hardware is going to get uh, plated, but um, just in remarkable condition. Another interesting thing about this, on this side, you see this shaft is different than this one in that it has this little uh, gear on it and it has this little brass uh, indicator on here that actually runs up and down. What this does is actually indicates where the gear is at. This piece is actually, uh, it has a little white dash on it right there. This piece is actually uh, sitting there and as the gear is traveling, the shaft is turning, it's moving this piece back and forth across the indicator, which in the cockpit is just a little plexiglass window that shows you the, which way the gear is moving. So again, very simple, very clever way to show if the gear is in transition uh, on and shows you that position of the landing gear. So that's basically how all that works. Um, one interesting thing we found, about, found out about when we actually took all this out was we discovered how the damage to a portion of the airplane uh, we talked about in one of the other episodes. There's a big tear on the right hand side up inside the wheel well and I was always curious as to how this was damaged, if it was damaged in the 
ground looping. But after removing um, these pieces, we discovered how that damage actually occurred. So we're going to talk about that real quick next. All right, everybody, we're going to talk about um, how we actually discovered how this damage uh, up inside this wheel well actually occurred. Uh, every time, ever since I started this project, I've seen this tear uh, in this, what we would call kind of the front spar attach point uh, of the aircraft. And I could just never figure out how this happened. Well, after we actually pulled these pieces out, we discovered exactly what occurred here. Now, this piece here we talked about earlier is the main drive with the worm gear in it. Uh, this piece actually uh, just fits right up inside here. It's actually attached to another uh, forging that's up inside the wing that holds it all in place. Now, this is held on by a series of studs. There's four studs that actually hold this in position. And to remove this, you have to take the nuts off that hold it in there. And then at that point, uh, I thought, well, you just push the whole thing out. So. I was on the opposite side and I started knocking this thing out and it came out to a certain point and it just stopped. And I was like, what's stopping that? Well, I realized what was stopping it was that this portion of the casting was hitting right here hard. In fact, on the other side, it was actually slightly bent. And so what I determined was you can't get this out just by taking the nuts off. And what probably happened was whoever took this out originally just drove it out. They just hit that and they said, well, that's what, the only way to get this thing out is just to whack it out of there. And they basically hit it and tore this out. So the really proper way to get it out is to remove the nuts, drive the four studs out. And once the studs are out, this whole piece just comes out way and it just drops down clear without hitting anything. But that's how this damage actually occurred. Someone just was just not smart enough to figure that out. And they actually started damaging the other side and they stopped. I think they caught themselves at that point because they realized um, they probably damaged this side and they didn't want to do the same thing there. What's really mysterious about this whole thing is why they never repair that. And it, it happened and they just left it that way and it flew that way for years, which is very odd. But we're gonna go in there now that we have all this out. We're gonna do a, a proper repair there. And we're also gonna pull out these other uh, casting pieces to check these for damage. Uh, we can't do that yet because these are actually attached to these jack points that the airplane's sitting on. We're going to have to lift the airplane up, move it back to another position to support it so we can get to these uh, pads uh, to remove this piece. But uh, basically, again, this is how we kind of discover all this. You have, look, you have to look closely at all these pieces as you're disassembling things. You kind of want to watch how things come out because uh, the airplane is talking to you. The parts are talking to you. They have all these little clues that give you that help you kind of determine what happened uh, along the way and how it comes apart properly and how it goes back together again. So a uh, pretty interesting note on disassembly of this component. All right, we're going to take this opportunity next to kind of answer a few questions that people have had uh, on some of the uh, past videos. And one of the questions that was asked was, well, who inspects the airplane? Uh, we talked about the ground loop and some of the damage we found back on the uh, tail. Have we gone back into the tail to inspect all this? Who determines whether it's airworthy? How do we make these determinations? Uh, but the first thing is we have gone back inside the airplane. We have looked at these areas that we've seen on the outside of the airplane, and we were able to determine that uh, none of this damage has actually spread from uh, the inside to other components. Uh, so that is one good thing. But as far as generally inspecting, it, it, it's mechanics that work here that look at everything. I'm not the only one that's going to look at this airplane when it's all said and done. Uh, I bring other people in uh, to make inspections. Jack or IA will look at certain things. Ken will look at things. And sometimes if I have a question or if I have a concern that I don't really know too much about, I'll try to find that information and I'll have that person come in and take a look at the airplane. So we have a lot of different eyes to look at the aircraft and make sure that it's safe. Uh, so if that, hopefully that answers that question. Uh, the next thing is uh, the interim panel. Somebody had noted that uh, we talked about this piece and whether or not this piece that held the DG, the directional gyro, was original. Somebody online had done some research and he said he didn't find any photos that showed a 108 with that piece. Well, that's fine. I appreciate the effort. But the thing is, on a lot of the civilian 108s, uh, these airplanes were kind of custom built and the instrument panel could be set up any way that the owner wanted. So it is possible that this was done at the factory. I'm not saying that it, it, that it wasn't, but uh, this the fact that I've seen several different layouts for the 108 on the instruments. Uh, and again, this was something that was kind of a customized thing. So this could be original, uh, we're not quite sure. 
And then the last thing somebody asked, I believe, was uh, why don't we look at the logbooks to determine whether the airplane was in an accident or not? Well, we have looked at the logbooks. I'm sure some of this is noted, but the logbooks are all in Spanish. I have to have some of this translated, but we actually have done some research with some other people, and there was a gentleman in Germany that we found out who actually sent me a whole history of the airplane, and in there, surprisingly enough, lists the fact that the airplane was in a ground loop accident. Also, the airplane had a bird strike on the left side, and I think we talked about that in one of the episodes, and that's what damaged the little leading edge piece uh, that's inside of there. So we go to all kinds of different sources to find out information, the logbooks, people who've known the airplane, people in Germany, that uh, have some history on aircraft and uh, so we do a lot of research to determine exactly what has happened to the airplane. That combined with the inspection that we're doing on the airplane, of course, is giving us the information that we need and the path that we need to take to correct these uh, damaged parts of the airplane. So hopefully that answers that question. Another thing I get a lot on the videos and stuff in, in general is that people always ask, well, I would love to have your job. It looks like so much fun and it'd be a great career and how do you get involved in all that? And it's, it's kind of a, a lot of things to answer there, but uh, to me, uh, there's certain things that it takes to do this. And I'm not talking about so much about um, what you can actually do with your hands. These things can be taught. Sheet metal can be taught. Uh, woodworking can be taught. Painting, all these things can be taught and a person can be trained to do these. But what it comes down to, what I find a lot, especially with the people who've been in this industry for a long time, is that it takes certain kind of personality traits to kind of deal with all this kind of thing. And the first thing that I like to talk about, or what it, it takes, is what I call the three P's, and that is passion, persistence, and patience. And first of all, passion is just uh, having a complete love for just all of this, not just the fun things like painting on uh, the markings at the end, or uh, installing the engine, or doing those things that look like you know, fast and easy, installing the wing. Everybody wants to be involved in that, but you have to love every bit of part of it, even right down to stripping the paint, like you've seen in the video, scraping the old grease off, taking the parts. You have to dislike all of it, not just what we're doing, but what other people are doing too. Uh, you just have to be really, uh, really passionate about it. Uh, the next thing, of course, is, is this patience. Uh, you've seen how long this takes. You've watched all these videos. You see how slow the progress is. And if you're somebody that wants like instant gratification, this is not the career for you. This stuff is, is like watching grass grow sometimes. You have to be so patient and you have to be very careful about how you take things apart so you don't damage things. Careful how you do things so you don't hurt yourself and the airplane. So that's important. And then the last thing on the, on the three P's is just persistence. Um, in the course of a restoration, there are so many hurdles and roadblocks that come up uh, that are trying to stop you from finishing the project. The airplane is against you the whole way most of the time. It's, it's just laughing at you. And so you have to have persistence. You have to realize uh, when to go forward, when to stop, when to kind of pull back, when to ask questions, getting information. And so if you're not persistent and if you kind of give up easy, if you have the kind of mindset like, oh, forget it, I'm never going to get this done, again, and not the career for you at all. So those are very important. And the next thing also I think is really, really important in this is uh, building relationships. And that is not just with the people you work with, although that's important. I have relationships with everybody here because I have to have the help of everybody. I have to have the help of sheet metal, woodworker, engine, mechanic. Uh, you can't do all this yourself. Some people say, I, I could do all this. So that's, that's, a, that's a bunch of baloney. You have to rely on a team of people. And also you have to rely on building relationships with people all around the world who have had experience with this type of airplane who have restored it before, who know the aircraft maybe better than you do. So I'm very careful when I'm building relationships with, with vendors who may have parts, uh, people who have restored the aircraft, talking to these people and getting as much information as I can and, and, and trusting those people and, and those people trusting me and building that one-on-one -on -one relationships. And those I find was actually one of the most important things to get a project done. And then I think the last thing is kind of a weird thing actually in a way is that you have to have somewhat of a obsessive personality when you're doing this. And what I mean by that is you're almost always thinking about it. It's kind of a strange thing because there's so many things to do that even when you're not here, your mind is always kind of thinking about the next step or well, how am I going to solve this problem? A lot of times I'll just be sitting on the couch watching TV and like a, a thought comes to my head about the airplane, about how to solve a problem that I had uh, a couple days ago. And then all of a sudden I have an answer to that. So my mind is like kind of always working uh, towards that. The bad side of that is, is that that times kind of gets in the way of, <laughs> of the relationships of other people around you because you're not like maybe totally engaged 
in uh, in what's going on all the time. But uh, but that's a whole other story right there. But uh, I find that a lot of times you just have to uh, kind of be able to separate work from uh, from family. But um, but again, other people that I know that do this for a living, they're kind of always thinking about it also. So uh, again, it's it like never really leaves your mind which uh, it can either be a good thing or a bad thing because sometimes it'll actually slowly drive you crazy. But, uh, but hopefully that kind of gives you an idea of what it kind of takes personality-wise. And if you have some of those traits, then it kind of helps. And so uh, it's, it's a great career. It's a, it's a cool job to have. And on the next episode, uh, we're going to talk about how actually I taught myself how to do this and how you can actually teach yourself how to pick up some of these traits and kind of learn what goes into restoration. So come back for the next rest the restoration update on the 108, and we'll talk about uh, that and also some more progress on the aircraft itself.